Good morning. Welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It's a blessing to see all of you here today. Um, we are very fortunate to have our guest today. But I wanted to begin with a poem by Robert Browning. Um, he writes a poem about the organist Charles Avison, and he, in it he writes, there is no truer truth obtainable by man than comes of music. So this year is the year of truth at Grace Cathedral, and uh, we're talking about the truth of music. We've talked about racism and politics, the environment, science. We've talked about um, journalism. Um, and now we're going to talk about music and the unique truth that music um, has for us. Our original guest for today's forum, Mark Hansen, the executive director of San Francisco Symphony, was called out of town suddenly for business. And I'm happy to welcome two members of his orchestra in his place. Charles Chandler, a bassist to my far left, is the first member of the San Francisco um, Symphony, who was a youth orchestra member first before coming to the San Francisco Symphony. He joined in 1992. And I used to like to listen to him back in the old days. Wow. And, uh, wow. I was a subscriber then. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, back at the dawn age. And Amos Yang is our first assistant cello who joined the symphony in 2007 and is also a San Francisco Bay Area native, was also a member of the youth orchestra and the San Francisco Boys Chorus. So he really brings together all the musical gifts that we love so much here. And finally, um, to share his experience and perspective on music is Ben Bachman, our um, cathedral's canon and director of music. Um, he's been on staff since 2005, and um, it's such a blessing to have you here, Ben. I depend on Ben every day of the week, and um, Ben probably does more for my spiritual life than anyone else. Uh, um, just the music is what really moves me these days. Mm. So I wanted to begin by asking um, the three of you to just talk a little bit about just what your childhood memories of music are. You know, what is your recollection of making music and hearing music? What first drew you to music when you were, when you were um, young? Well, for me, I started the cello at the age of five, uh, and actually even a little bit uh, earlier. And it was just happenstance that I began the cello because I had been playing violin for literally two, three weeks. I have an older brother and an older sister. Uh, my sister is a wonderful pianist. My brother is a violinist in the Rochester Philharmonic today. Oh, so th great. they were already yeah. involved with music, but we were switching to a new um, a musical setting at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And we just by chance bumped into an old family friend whose daughter was about to begin cello lessons with this great new teacher who hadn't had a class yet. And she said, you should have Amos audition for Irene Sharp. And my mom looked down at me and said, would you like to play cello? And I just shrugged my shoulders and said, sure. It's pretty much the same as the violin, right? So I wish it was a very romantic story about how I heard a recording of Casals or Jacqueline Dupre and I <laughs> fell in love, but it was just this 30 second chance meeting that actually changed the course of my musical life because the cello is by far my favorite musical instrument. Right, right, right. And had I, I'm pretty convinced actually, had I become a violinist, uh, I mean, had I started on the violin, I would not have become a violinist and necessarily pursued music. So it's just incredible, really, I, I think that that was providence and meant to happen that we bump into that family friend. Yeah, I, I feel the same way about my playing the clarinet. I, I, like I, I played it because it, it was versatile, it could be played in a bunch of different settings, but I really came to love the tone quality of the instrument. So, so that, like the sound of a bassoon or an oboe or a clarinet, and that's, that, I, I love that sound, but I don't know if it's, you know, was influenced by that, starting on the clarinet or, or, or you know, what came first. Right. You know? Well, and in terms of my first um, musical memories, one of the wonderful things that Irene Sharp would do, and you speak about community, was a monthly class, um, and she would have one for her older kids, ranging from 13 to 20, and for the younger kids, 5 to 11 or 12, we would meet at her house, wow. and she'd have about 20 small chairs set up, 
a few stands, and she would run a class. And we would do scales together. One person would play a note. The next person would play the next note, the next. <clears throat> and then we would also then perform for each other, whoever had a piece ready. And because of that, I find that all the kids from that period, we don't, uh, we grew up with very confident performance um, right. Uh, right. stage presence, and not that we're, we're all phenomenal, incredible cellists, but we have this awareness that it's okay to make mistakes, um, it's okay to fall down with this community of uh, like-minded people. It was just great for all that support. She'd actually ask us to comment on each other's playing, so we, we learned very early on put the positive before the negative, right, and all good. of that. <laughs> and frankly, that's still a technique I use in my chamber music rehearsals. Mm -hmm. You know, Even if it's very hard for Charles to, uh, we have a duo, ch right. bass and cello duo, if it's hard for him to say something nice about my playing, he might say something like, Amos, your suit looks <laughs> so nice today. <laughs> but could you play that a little bit more in tune? <laughs> so, and that, that still works. It still makes me feel pretty good. Good so. tie choice. <laughs> it is. And, you know, it's, it is something about learning how to perform and being, uh, um, it, having an audience. It's just, that's a, um, requires, uh, you know, um, training and preparation for it, too. All right. Ben, how about you? Like, what is your childhood memory of music? I mean, I just can't even imagine you without music. Well, my, my dad is a professional musician as well. He's a classical guitarist. And so I think that, you know, we, I started piano lessons when I was about six or seven. And I think I always assumed that everyone in the world took piano lessons. Um, everyone in my family reads music, um, no matter what they do with their careers. Um, and of course, you know, we used to watch like Leonard Bernstein conducting and I remember being very little and my dad talking about what beat patterns were and, and things like that. And, and I guess it was just, I always thought that everybody kind of did that, you know, yeah, everybody yeah. grows up and they, you learn the conducting patterns and um, things like that. So I played the violin for a few months and uh, until I felt that my mother's health was in peril because of it. <laughs> so she said, Cho choose, a, choose an instrument. She said, you're good at the piano, let's stick to that. Right, yeah. right. And we had uh, neighbors, I had no interest, of course, in the, I'd never seen a pipe organ, and I had no interest in, in really in church music or choral music or anything like that, until the, our neighbor across the street said, oh, you know, our church has a really good choir and you should come and hear them. And they brought me to hear Evensong, and I was about eight or nine years old, and I remember thinking, they sound, this choir sounds like um, our, my dad's record of Handel's Messiah. Oh, wow. And I said, I didn't know that people sang like that anymore, and that there was something actually in my neighborhood. So it really kind of very suddenly changed my feelings about singing with this children's choir. Um, and then when I saw the console of the pipe organ, that looks like the cockpit of a, you know, of a huge airplane or something. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, that's what, that's, I'll play that instrument. That looks like a lot of fun. Um, and so that's what I did. And um, I, I didn't sing a note in the choir. When I joined the choir, I was very, very shy. And I really kind of stood there and, and lips, lip synced, lip sank yeah. for about, <laughs> um, for about two years before I opened my mouth. So, yeah. Well, it's so lovely. We had the in investiture of the choir, well, choristers this week. And to see Ben um, teaching one of the boys how to conduct the, the boys at the, um, to do the grace. And, and Ben, um, just, just, the, just the way he took, helped the boy with his gestures. I mean, it was just, he was learning what you had learned kind mm. of like right, you know, from yeah. the very beginning. And yeah. here he was slightly older than you were when you were learning that. Yeah, yeah Ben is a, a wonderful teacher. How about you, Charles? What are your memories of childhood music? Well, th something that Ben said really resonated with me, which is that you thought that this was the normal way everybody played a musical instrument and was involved with that. And my situation was somewhat similar. Um, my mother was a flute play, uh, as a f played principal flute in Marin Symphony, and was also teaching when I was growing up fifty flute students a week in, in Mill Valley. And um, so my early childhood was listening to lots and lots and lots and lots of flute lessons all the time. <laughs> and one time somebody showed up at the house, just like not for a flute lesson, and I, and I said, 
well, where's your flute? Because <laughs> I just thought everybody had a flute, you know? <laughs> so, um, but that, that was really inspirational for me and in the way that Irene Sharp had these big organized events and, and created the sense of community. My mom did the same thing with her flute students and would have these big, we lived above the Dipsy Trail in Mill Valley. Oh, yeah, of course. And she'd have these big, flute events where we'd come down the dipsy stairs into Old Mill Park and do these like rhythmic exercises and the wonderful thing about the flute is it's so portable. I, I, I do play the bass and it's just uh, a lot of times people ask me that way. Why, <laughs> <laughs> why didn't, don't you wish you played the flute? So. But that's that um, seeing that community and kind of a feeling like this is just what part of life is, is playing music and communicating that way was was really making the foundation for me going into music, I think. Um, so how did you, how did the bass become your thing? I mean, um, do, do people say, why aren't you playing the flute ever? Oh yes, certainly, <laughs> certainly people, people definitely say that. I, I, um, I just immediately, for some reason, really loved singing the bass part to all of these melodies going on around me. and. Um, uh, instead of singing the melodies, I ended up singing the harmonies to them, right. um, just kind of naturally. And um, I also really was drawn to the way that the double bass feels. It, 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 you as much feel the instrument as you do hear it, so while you're playing it, it vibrates so much that you just get this incredible physical sensation, and it's really, um, really soothing and comforting, and I just, I really like that. A yeah. Lot, so. yeah, my son, when he was singing bass, felt the same way. He's like, I'd like to try playing a bass. Mm. It just was, you know, just didn't have the chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do diff different musicians who play different musical instruments have like? Is there kind of like a, um, like a caricature of the like? Are, are flutists and one one kind of person and oboists another kind of person and um, cellists another kind of person? I, I, like what are what are, you know what is the? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think there are a couple of different organist personality types. <laughs> I think some organists are, are very, you know, like to have complete control yeah, over yeah. things and that's why, you know, it's an instrument that doesn't always play well with others. Right. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, a great it's, it's a lot about being loud and, and, um, yeah. and power. But the other type of organist personality is people that are actually, you know, very jolly and sort of gregarious right. and they don't like to be alone. They uh. like to have everybody involved and get that kind of thing. and. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely, I think there are definitely personality types for organists. When Charles yeah, was instruments. talking about that bass feeling, I mean, that's what the, you, when you play, I feel, I oh. feel, the, oh, yeah. I feel the, the, the vibration of it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. You know, I, I hadn't yeah. thought about the actually physical, the non-hearing part of mm -hmm. feeling the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you probably can't, I mean, maybe you can't say anything about your colleagues and different musicians have different um, personality traits or characteristics. I think definitely. Um, of course, these are very broad, general stereotypes. Yeah, yeah stereotypes. stereotypes. That's right. Yeah. 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 Asking about the stereotypes. Um, for example, um, at music festivals when we were young, like at Tanglewood, we would often have a cello section get together, very um, close-knit group, very friendly, warm, often hanging out with each other. The violas would do the same thing, the basses, and you would never hear about a violin get together. Right. You know, it's very <laughs> so uh, you can read into that what you will. I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I say that very lightheartedly because we have a wonderful violin section actually and they're all very yeah. close and they do a lot together. But that's often the type of personality um, right, that, right. that gravitates maybe towards the violin that wants to um, do the lead voice all the time versus a personality that maybe enjoys right, supporting. Singing that. And exactly. it takes all, all kinds. And of course, we have a stereotypical um, brass where you think, well, it's a very loud instrument and they like a lot of attention and they, they play big, but we have an incredible yeah. brass section. These guys are incredibly smart, funny, <laughs> but they can also play really loud, but they can also play really <laughs> soft. So um, it's, it's a really interesting um, 
collection of people. So what about um, like the percussionists? I mean, because I was there for the the um, the public the you know, the San Francisco public concert that had the oh um, yeah right. yeah yeah. So I was right there. Oh, wow. Do, you know, are they kind of more marginalized? Are they you know? Oh, because they know, are kind of on the outer edges of the whole. In our group, we have such strong players in every section. Yeah, yeah. And if you've noticed when you come, one of the things I noticed when I came to my first San Francisco Symphony concert um, after I returned was what amounts of applause our bassoon section receives. And those guys are just phenomenal. Yeah. We have Steve Paulson. This week we're doing the Stravinsky Rite of Spring. Oh, yeah. And it starts off with a huge bassoon solo. Yeah. And I won't divulge. Steve's age, but he's been in the orchestra a long time. Yeah. But if you hear him play, age for sure is just a number. He sounds incredible every time he pulls it out. So it's, and in the percussion you asked specifically, those guys are also just brilliant. And they're of course the backbone of our orchestra because of the amount of rhythmic support right. that they create. And uh, as Charles, and as you're alluding to, that's why we have to have a, a live community experience at the hall. And um, the amount of why someone comes to the hall and can't duplicate the experience at home, no matter how great your audiophile yeah. stereo might be, is the movement of air, the vibrations that you feel, what you experience in a live setting. That's a once in a lifetime moment. Right, Each right. of those moments It'll never there. be quite like you that. Cannot, yeah. um, you cannot duplicate it. And for example, there's a, a Charles has seen this done. I, wanted to, I asked him earlier if, if it was true. If you lit a match and put it in front of the base F hole and he plucked, the amount of air coming out could put out that match. Oh, wow. And if, when I take my cello out later after, after this form, um, you're welcome to come up and put your hand right in front of our, our F holes, which are on the front of the instrument, and you'll feel the amount of energy that comes out of these instruments, because it really is a tactile thing that you can't um, replace if yeah. it's not a live performance. Right, right. I mean, that's definitely what I felt like being there the last time I was there. I, I wonder, too, I mean, there, there's so much change in, in technology. I mean, you know, the organ, it, you know, it used to be an analog instrument and now it's a digital instrument. Um, so that the instrument itself has changed, you know, the connections between the pipes and the, the console. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been so many other changes, too. I mean, um, just from social media changes to changes in music sharing services like Spotify, to um, changes in recording equipment. And I wonder um, you know, just what, what technological changes you've seen and how it's changing kind of your, your life and your work. Mm. Well, I mean, I think it is, you know, recordings were really, I think, the biggest change for musicians mm -hmm. um, ever because you are, your work is now being held to kind of a static standard, yeah. right? Somebody m made this recording and now every time they listen to you, you know, in fact, I've, how many have you gotten this compliment? Oh, you played that so well, it was just like the great recording by so-and-so. Oh, wow. And you're like, wow, I really, I didn't really want that, that <laughs> particular <laughs> comparison. But I think that was really the, bi the biggest of all the changes. Um, I mean, I think that, the, that social media or Spotify and things like that, you know, um, uh, expand that, that particular right. issue. But I think that was really essentially the biggest issue. Um, and you, and I think it's also harder, I think it's harder to, to gain an audience, you know, and it's harder to keep people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that these are all necessarily bad things because like you say, when people actually show up and, and it feels or the experience is so much different than the recorded experience mm. that, you know, that you, you can really win, win over an audience that way. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah. I think it's always surprising. Of course, we webcast a lot of our things, right, and right. Um, when somebody from S uh, Sydney, Australia, has been listening to the choir on the internet for 17 years, and then finally comes to San Francisco and comes to the Even Song on Thursday or whatever, it's such a different, completely different experience yeah. than what they've experienced that way. So that's a really positive. You know, like, they get part of the story, mm -hmm. but then you actually have to come to San Francisco to get the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so. That's mm -hmm. great. How about the two of you? I mean, um, what changes have you noticed just in terms of just all kinds of technology during your career? 
Well, with um, with recording, I just I feel like it's it's an absolutely wonderful thing, and the record, the permanent record, is going to be wonderful as time goes on. But it, it's made a, as a performer as much more conscious, a detail conscious oh, yeah. of um, you know intonation, scratches. There needs to be to match recordings, which which can and very oftentimes have notes spliced together, and um, you try as a performer to attain that level. And I think one of the things for myself that I try to think of is, I, I feel like, I wonder if in the past the, the emphasis was, was still on playing technically beautifully, but, it was a, but the priority in one's mind might have been about what is the mood, what is the spirit, what is the way that I'm interacting with you personally, as opposed to worrying about cracking a note here and there to try to match these recordings. So I, I think the recording thing is wonderful, don't, don't get me wrong, but I do also feel like it, it makes you need to sort of remember to stay in balance and to remember sort of what is it all about. Is it about cracking notes or is it about getting this mood or, or sharing something with people? I, if I may, I, I actually, some, uh, someone posted on Facebook this week a really interesting film from the early 30s of George Gershwin playing his own I Got Rhythm. And the thing that's really amazing about it is he makes a lot of mistakes, yeah. including mistakes in the melody, <laughs> a, a melody that he wrote. Yeah. But, and, 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 and the Facebook friend comments on this. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. But the energy and the excitement and the spontaneity of that moment was so incredibly powerful that, you know, the, the audience just really goes crazy. And so you can tell from, from looking at things like that in the past that there wasn't, you know, that, that idea of technical perfection down mm -hmm. to the last detail was not as high a priority maybe yes. as the big picture. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it just me as like being a kid, like a 12-year-old kid, thinking about being a musician like you are, I mean, I did think about that. Do you want your whole life, how much of your life do you want being dedicated to kind of perfection, and how much do you want your life being dedicated to kind of a, a relationship with the people that are around you? Mm. So when I play the ukulele with my children at the beach and we're singing together as a family, it, we're definitely, I mean, it, we're not worried about, you know. Yes. The, it's, and that's the opposite extreme of just being that in that recording studio and, and trying to have everything be just completely perfect. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the media that we have now also, like YouTube, for example, if we're preparing a piece for the symphony um, that is unfamiliar to me, oh, yeah. I'll often go and I'll look for recordings because most things have been recorded that we, we play, many right, things. exactly. And it's actually very refreshing to see very fine orchestras, very fine players, and to Ben's point, they're live. Yeah. So I see actually the wonderful music making the quality, but I also see mistakes. Yeah. So it also puts me at ease. Well, if <laughs> this brilliant orchestra that is revered around the world and this principal cellist maybe made this, this slight mistake, that's OK for me too. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> and actually, it's a little bit liberating, because if it were only the recordings that I uh, that we purchased that have been right, worked the over and the, the reverb has been and maybe even some tonal adjustments um, made it sort of raises a uh, a little bit of a sterile unrealistic standard um, now charles and i actually just completed a recording of uh, that a friend of a piece that a friend of ours wrote for us uh, called Burialage by shinji ashima and it's an incredible piece but we and we've been playing it a lot the last year and we struggled with that in the studio, you know, just trying, oh, I missed that note, and how do we keep it organic? Um, and generally, the way to do that is to do complete run-throughs. It sort of seems contrary. You might want to do just the smallest sections, and of course you can do that eventually, but the recording engineer who has so much more experience doing this than, than we do found that and advised us, look, really, do, do a few run-throughs. Just comes out much better if you start to micromanage, mm -hmm. trying to get rid of that wart, that little pimple. Yeah. It's you're gonna, it's gonna ruin Have other parts. On the whole. Right. Yeah, that's so interesting about the YouTube. I mean, it's just the way it, it's changing the way we learn, um, and we're less isolated, and we can be connected to. If a symphony in Australia is the only symphony that's done this piece before, then you're suddenly connected to them in a way that you just wouldn't be able to be before. Right. You know, it's not like you're going to fly all the way around the world to, mm -hmm. to um, go hear that. 
Um, I, I was wondering, I mean, you probably, um, I don't know how much you have to do with amateur musicians. Um, all of you. I mean, I, I don't even know. Do you ever talk to amateur musicians? I guess organized sometimes. Yeah. 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 But I mean, what advice do you have for them in terms of just like um, for enriching their, 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 their music or, or um, loving it more or being better at what they do? I mean, do, do you even have advice for, for people like that? Well, I would say keep doing what you love and um, uh, stay in those communities, chamber music, small orchestras. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine did a calculation once of the percentage of musicians that make it into um, the highest level yeah. orchestras. And frankly, the percentages were even worse than some of these kids trying to make it into the NBA. I can imagine mm -hmm. that. So imagine <laughs> that, that, mm -hmm. yeah. that trying to find one of our our jobs and win it in an audition on that specific day against a uh, competition that's been training all their lives. It's, right. it's a, a steep climb. So frankly, most of the people I grew up with, um, or many of them, are amateur musicians and they find so much joy in the community of chamber music where, the, uh, where a handful of friends will come together for dinner, read quartets. Oh, that's great. Um, um, we also, I've worked with the Stanford Orchestra in the past yeah. and these brilliant kids who find music as an incredible outlet from the stress of their work or the chamber series um, at um, um, UCSF that we go into. It's just incredible. Um, the, these people who have these high stress jobs, um, you know, if I play a wrong note, right, someone exactly. is not the plane's harmed. not going to crash. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah. As yeah, I, exactly. I go to that place and so many people yeah. after those concerts have come up and said, I really appreciate you coming for these lunchtime concerts and I also play myself yeah. and it just is a way for me to, to feed my soul and to put things into perspective. Yeah. And I think that's really important. We actually had a incredible, and I say this in the past tense, but I hope it will also return, um, a program called, um, what was the amateur? Um, oh, uh, sorry, Miss. We will, I, it will come to me. Yeah. But basically what it was, was an invitation for a couple evenings where we invited people from the community to bring their instruments and get a coaching from us. So the cellists would all come. Right. I would give them a coaching or another cellist from the section. and after that coaching, they've had a chance to prepare those pieces. The whole group would get on stage, on the stage of Davies, with a conductor and play music. Uh, at the oh, same piece. Great. We're all working yeah. on the same piece and so everyone can experience it that way. And I know the Boston Symphony also has a similar uh, program like that. And it's just an incredible thing to see yeah, how, it's very cliche to say, but really is a universal language. Oh, yeah, and yeah. the fact that we can tour <clears throat> Europe and, the, and Asia as we do and make connections because of what we do, it's a real blessing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ben? Do you have any? Well, I mean, I think like uh, volunteer choir members, they often, um, they've often have figured out that um, music is available to, to everybody. Um, I don't like the idea, and I'm sure, you know, of the sort of that you're special and I'm not special. Yeah. You're special because you know how to read music. Well, learning how to read music is, is not particularly, I think it's something that's available to everybody. Yeah. I think it's something that will enrich everybody's lives. And the more literate people you have in your society, the better everything is going to be. You know, there's going to be more orchestras and more choirs because people will have found that. You know, right. I don't know where the idea, the abhorrent idea, that music is not important, but this, that, or that it's on a lower level of things than, than other educational priorities, mm -hmm. but I think that was not, uh, not true. And, yeah. I, and so I, I would always encourage everybody to find something musical that they can do. Yeah, you know? and that's a great point too. I mean, just kind of what is the state of music now in terms of, you know, like who are you seeing in your audiences? What are you doing to kind of expand the reach? I mean, because the one thing that all four of us share in common is that our parents were all passionate about music. Mm. Um, so what do you do with the huge number of people whose parents weren't um, mm. like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, The symphony, one of the most important things that we do is a community outreach. And, and I, I want to say that orchestra for our members in, in San Francisco that, that uh, the symphony supported and created was called uh, 
Oh, community, community, community of music, of music, of music makers. makers. So that's, that's a was. really beautiful name, actually. Yes, yeah. um, but I, th I think that Ben, like what you were saying about, uh, it's very difficult to measure the impact of music, and so there, therefore, it's hard to, in a certain way, numerically, to give it support. And uh, it's incredibly powerful, you know. So. Um, yeah, but it's, it's like, so how do we get the word out about that? I mean, I, it's just, you, yeah. you know, it's, how do we help create that audience? Right, well, I mean, I think that, I think that having open rehearsals and having these educational opportunities is, is really good. I think I'm in the slightly different field because I work for a church. Right, and so right. a lot of times people will think that I've got my hymnal in one hand and the BCP in the other, like <laughs> I'm ready to convert people, when in fact it might be just nothing more than an opportunity to sing or to make music. Right. Um, so that, that's an extra challenge for, for us, you know, um, bringing them into the building. Um, but, uh, but I do think a lot of it is about education and being, being a kind of surrogate father <laughs> right to right. all those people that yeah. that maybe didn't have parents that were passionate about music. Right, that's but I think I think it's a lot about you know being being enthusiastic, being persuasive, and helping people to feel calm yeah. in the <clears throat> and, and receptive to what what you're what you're offering. Right, right. And Stravinsky is it's a hard sell. <laughs> you know? It's not an easy that. sell, but but you can feel the same electricity that I feel just because we're both people. Right, right. Yeah. right. Well, and one of the things that the symphony uh, is fortunate to have is this incredible volunteer league, people who are passionate about what we do. And one of the things that we do um, in appreciation for what they do is go out and we do smaller chamber concerts. So Charles and I, or I will go with three other colleagues as a string quartet and give concerts for these leagues of maybe anywhere from 15 to 40 people in a room not much bigger than, than this. Yeah. And I think for me and the feedback we've gotten from audience members who are able to come to these smaller gatherings is it's so effective to, again, I think it's a matter of the, the energy and, and the, the movement of the flow, uh, everything that we do. So for me, on a smaller level, it's usually more impactful. And of course, the symphony, it's great when we fill Davies and we have over 2,000 people there. That's a different kind of energy yes. as well, but I think it's important to, to make it small as well. Yeah, yeah that's really helpful. I um, was re remember reading um, Alex Ross's book, The Rest is Noise, um, listening to music in 20th century. Um, uh, uh, and I remember um, l actually listening to that Rites of Spring, that, like playing the recording of that while I was listening to him discuss it. Oh, and wow. I, st I, like, I remember where I was sitting, I remember wow. the feeling mm -hmm. of the music, I mean, it was very powerful. But one of the things he talks about is just kind of music and politics, so um, especially totalitarianism in the 20th century in music. And I just, I don't even know if, how you, if you think about politics very much or, you know, what is the connection between politics and music now? Oof. Well, I, <laughs> I, th I, th I feel like it overlaps with a little bit of what we were talking about earlier. I really liked that you were talking about playing um, for your children, playing music casually on the beach. And I f kind of feel like Ben thinking that every, everybody was a musician and everybody's a pianist and my idea about, well, where's your flute? That every, yes. it's a, without, without any kind of education, music is a universal language and things that you can't say like oh I, I this morning on my way x y and z help happened to me or this has been going on in the back of my mind for a really long time and you could try to verbalize and articulate certain things or the way that you connect with a certain composer you could try to say that but without any sort of education at all these feelings of you playing for your children, they get immediately what, what that's about, you know, and where, where you're coming. And it's a commonality of everybody coming from completely different walks of life and sharing this and understanding it in this incredibly intimate way. And so how does it overlap with politics? I feel like it breaks down all of those, all of those social barriers and differences completely with just, you know, right from the get-go. 
Yeah, and one of the things I'm getting from this is that it's, it isn't just about what happens in Davies Hall. It's about, everywhere, it's about you guys being here this morning at mm -hmm. the crack of dawn. And, um, and, and it's about all those different moments where, where, where music is part of, of, of who we are. Do you have anything to add, Amos, about just the politics of music? Well, I think to piggyback on Charles's point, um, the whole Suzuki movement. Right. You know, uh, again, when Suzuki came and brought his hundreds of kids playing at this incredible level. He was showing that what music is about is emotion and feeling more so than any sort of special gift. Because when someone, I don't know how you feel, Charles, but comes up to me and says, oh, you are, you're just so gifted. Um, to be able to do what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, actually, there's a very small percentage, perhaps, of our population that is literally tone deaf, right, maybe right, cannot right, carry right. pitch. Maybe there are very small fraction of people that, but frankly, I think most people could also be trained. So that aside, if you have feelings and if you um, can carry tune, you can make music yeah. and again I think that's it goes along with his underlying breaking down all the the barriers um, and and walls yeah. that go into politics yeah when Ben plays I mean it's just you feel them you feel his his personality in the music and when you conduct Ben mm. you can see, he can he can convey that in his physical gestures mm. so there is something very powerful but it's like it's your personality it's not just mm. yeah. it's not just some like technique or something right 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 Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, there, there are pieces and, and things throughout history where, where politics has influenced music and the life of musicians. We could talk about Shostakovich, we yeah. could talk about Prokofiev as kind of 20th century examples exactly. of that. But, but ultimately, you're exactly right, which is that um, music as a language is actually only about breaking down barriers and not building things up. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, this, the, the attempt of certain governments to suppress or silence or, or even to suggest that this language is, is not as important as you might think it is, is, you know, an attempt to kind of create that, that yeah. barrier. But no, music is a, is a universal language, and I think it belongs to to almost everybody. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I, I, I mean, it's the so every year we have a, a a theme for the cathedral, and this year the, is the year of truth, and and so I was wondering about that too. Is are there are, is there ways can music not be truthful? Mm -hmm. I mean, in what ways is it? Can it be manipulative? Or I mean, it, 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 like what is your take on just like the relation between music and truth, or the style of truth mm -hmm. that is music? Well, I do think music is manipulative, but I don't think that that is bad. Right. You know, I love being manipulated when it's to make for positive feelings yeah, and yeah. for things like that. It's different than being taken advantage of. Right. I mean, I, I know when I sit down at the, at the organ that I can set the tone for the next hour and a half of your life, yeah. right? By playing this hymn a certain well, way. Even or, more than that, I mean, what yeah. happens is, I, like I woke up on Wednesday and I was singing the hymn that was, we heard. Uh, it, it was the only thing that was left from the whole service. It's just like this little remnant of it. Right, hymn. right, right. And that's because I wanted that to yeah, be the, yeah. th a thing that. To last. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So um, I don't remember what the other it's part. Just as like truth. What is the relation between truth and music? Oh, well, yes. I mean, so, you know, truth and truth and manipulating people. I mean, I think there is always a part of truth that is something that is a faith element. Like you, you have to believe me. I can't prove this, that right, this is right. true, yeah. right? But I do know it's that- trust. Right, it is trust. You wanna build a trusting, that's exactly what yeah. it is. You want, you want the people that are listening or singing with you to trust you and to believe that there is something because it is positive and it's life affirming and, and because it makes you feel good, but, but not just in a superficial way, that there is something inherently true about it. Yeah. I can't describe it. I can't put it into words. Maybe that's why I'm a musician and, and why it's music, you know? Right, right, exactly. But yes, I do think it, there is inherent truth in music. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, great thing about music, one of them is um, if I were to play a piece for you now, every single person in this room would experience it differently. But I think you would all be able to sense whether 
I was coming from a genuine place. And I had this experience in my 20s. I was at the Tanglewood Music Center, and there's a musical legend there, uh, Louis Krasner, a wonderful musician. And he was at the point of his life where he um, it was not very mobile. He would sit in a room and actually students would come by voluntarily if they had something to play and play for him. I remember coming to him with some Bach and I played through for him and he said, you know, that's, it's very wonderful, but I don't feel your connection to the music. And he said, play it again and try to feel connected. Pretend I'm not here, pretend you don't have this busy s schedule. Um, and I played again, and he said, now that's, that's it. I had also taken the advice of another teacher who said, Amos, you know, as a cellist, of course, your cello, we are not a loud instrument, so we're always working on projection. Oh, hmm. And now close your eyes and play. And actually, that's a real experience. I've, I've experimented with that a lot. So a lot of times when I give a recital, I will close my eyes. It's not that I mm. want to tune out the audience in any way. In fact, it's the opposite. I find that they're able to get a better sense of what I'm doing, and I'm able to do it more truthfully, really oh, yeah. more direct, and I have a, a center. But it was so interesting because Mr. Krasner was so right. When I went in the first time, I think I was a little bit nervous and wasn't sure he'd be impressed and here's this huge legend <clears throat> but all he wanted was me to play in a connected fashion to be very genuine to what i'm doing so i think um it's very difficult though because what we do is coming on stage and basically becoming very vulnerable right. for that amount of time that we're on stage because i want to show you how much i really care about this music and how it's attached to my past, mm. which is very different from yours, but mm. take it or leave it here it is. <laughs> Versus, I think, um, some of the bigger showmen, um, actually, they can be wonderful players, but you don't get a connection. So, but that balance is so hard, obviously, yeah. because you need a certain technical proficiency to have people want to hear you play. Um, I can't just go up and play truthfully but horribly out of tune and out of rhythm. Right. So, because <laughs> um, truthfully, that's sometimes how I play. <laughs> right. But but that's not the kind of play that people want to hear. Yeah. So um, one of our traditions at the forum is to take questions. Rebecca's um, collecting the questions. Um, but I, I wonder what you have to say, Charles, about truth, and or, or if you have anything. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I think I feel similarly to Amos and, and Ben too, in, in that. Um, it's it's so mu a musical experience is the closest that I can think of coming to to truth for myself personally, and it's sharing, it's sharing. It's it's really very much about the audience. It's sh it's connecting with with them and and getting allowing them to understand and communicate and share in the all the human experience of being a human being and and that sense of community and understanding and the depth of that, it, it, it's wonderful. And, and getting to play with Amos, a lot of times I feel like he's having conversations with me on, <laughs> uh, right. uh, as, we're, as we're going on and, and um, getting to uh, share that journey together. It's How has that changed your relationship? Because I mean, in the big orchestra, you probably, you probably, you probably didn't have as much of a sense for each other. Uh, right. How has playing in this kind of a smaller setting um, affected your, your, your just your friendship? Oh, it's been great. It's been it's it's been wonderful to be able to overlap on this. There's a lot of other things we 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 were friends before we started playing and doing some bike rides and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, being able to share share this has just added to it immensely. Yeah. The physical part of being a professional musician, I, I know that Ben is careful about um, you know, not doing things that might hurt his hands. Um, <laughs> I, I just didn't know if that affected how you lived, lived at all. It, 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 do you ever think, oh, I better not do this, I, I might sp sp sprain a tendon or something? Yeah, it should more than, than we pay attention to, it really should. <laughs> it's funny you should bring that up because just on Friday, 
I gathered a, f a few colleagues from the orchestra and we played basketball. Yeah, right. You know, and that's the, the yeah. worst sport. You know, I actually used, <laughs> I've broken this hand playing basketball, yeah. luckily when I was 17 and it, it healed very quickly. But, you know, we, we, had, we have this joke going like, well, we have Mark in a way, our principal trumpet over there, so I cannot hit him in the mouth. Right. <laughs> He huh. knows I play cello. He cannot hit my hands. He can hit me in the head, <laughs> give me a concussion, all of, but cannot hit my hands. And we so have this. When I was a boy, my um, best friend was Mark's brother, um, Stephen. Oh, wow. And oh, my little Marky would always be tagging along all the time. <laughs> and uh, so we'd, we'd, we had this kind of like alternate wow. band that we produced. And little Marky would always be there. He's always following along. It was pretty funny to see him on the list there at the San Francisco Symphony. Wow. So, so to your question about do we do anything special, we, we probably should be a little bit more careful at times, but, you know, accidents happen. We've had people on tour break ankles jumping oh, down yeah. from rocks and things like <laughs> that, but, but uh, knock on wood, so far we've been okay. We have so many great <laughs> questions here. Um, please talk about music as spectacle, spectacle, um, like the San Francisco opera singers, um, music compared to other arts. <laughs> nah. M music as spectacle. Here, you can read it yourself. Yeah, I'm look I, w I was looking over your shoulder. And yeah, I, I, <laughs> I want to get a. I, I don't know. I mean, I do love. I mean, I absolutely love drama. You know, mu you yeah. know, music and drama, uh -huh. and um, of course, having a ju this big, beautiful building with amazing stained glass windows. I mean, we are very into musical spectacle. Yeah, I mean, I and I don't. Uh, and again, I don't think that that's a glib. Yeah. Dismissive, you know what I mean? You, you know, I, I think that's hugely important. The affect of a moment, you know, you're, and it's something that I always preconceive. Like, I, I really want this to f to land this way. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the procession was coming around the corner just at the moment that we hit that chord? And you know, and and um, and it's wonderful when it when it goes absolutely right. But yes, I, I definitely think of. Church services as 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 many yeah. operas, you know, and I'm dramas. so grateful because I, I'm so glad somebody's paying attention to that. Right, right, you know yeah. I mean? Here's another great question: What traits are SFS musicians looking for in the next music director? Mm. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 you know. so that's a reference to the fact that uh, Michael Tilson Thomas in another year will have finished 25 years with the orchestra and will be um, finishing up his tenure with us. So we're going to miss him a yeah. great deal. He's been such an incredible leader for the orchestra. And to give you some background, the, the conductor before him was Herbert Blumstedt, yeah. who really developed a um, very beautiful personal style um, in a completely different way to Michael. So I, I give you those two examples because they're very Different so people. what's the characteristics of the two of them? Because I remember when the cha I remember Herbert Blunt Bloomstead, I remember Michael Tilson Thompson arriving. Like, wh what is the difference? I mean, I can see there's like a difference in personal style. Right. Well, Herbert Bloomstead is incredibly consistent um, uh, and methodical, and you can almost predict what he's going to work on and the method yeah. he is going to do it. Um, Michael is fast on his feet, incredible with his vocabulary and the way he describes things, has incredible vision for new ways to reach audiences. Mm. And um, being a protege of Bernstein yeah. brought a lot of that theatrical, and he has a lot of that in his family background, theatrical um, dramatic instinct. That's you know, that's why he does, a um, lot of things very well, but especially, for example, this week, if you watch him conduct Stravinsky, uh, it's really beautiful and, and powerful uh, conducting. So I think in our next um, conductor, I can't speak for the whole orchestra, but I am on the committee, so I am reading yeah, right, often, of course. often yeah. uh, descriptions of what people like. I know we also have evaluations, so we know what types of conductors we gravitate towards. Um, and so I think we're looking for someone who hopefully has some of the dynamic qualities or many of the dynamic qualities that Michael has, but also someone who will be a good fit for San Francisco. Someone that can reach this broad spectrum, um, is comfortable speaking to um, um, companies in Silicon Valley, yeah, yeah. continuing to get our audiences, not necessarily um, 
younger and younger. Because frankly, if you look throughout history, I mean, the people who also had the means and the time to go to concerts, maybe it wasn't necessarily that much a younger yeah, a group of that's people. That's a great, great point. You know, a lot of people think, my goodness, why don't we have more teenagers and 20-somethings? Well, they're still going to school. They're still paying off student loans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're yeah. still doing this and that. And I think it's not, again, not necessarily that different yeah. if we were to go back in time and look at those mm -hmm. audiences. The disc um, having those student discounts was really great for me, I gotta say, yeah. I, I really appreciate yes. that. Is, is there anything you want to say about the process? Just, um, uh, I'm glad to hear that there are musicians that are, are part of the committee. Yes. Um, that, that's really reassuring. To well, me. we have an incredible board. Um, we have a wonderful new leader in Mark Hansen, and I think it's a really great um, symbiotic relationship that we're using checks and balances because, of course, um, some people are more concerned about um, the bottom line, yeah, right. and which I'm very grateful for, yeah. because you need you need that, especially in a city like San Francisco, obviously. But we can also uh, inform them. You know, this person does this kind of music great, but there's this huge hole here. This person is able to do this style of music right. and and this. And um, we're also it's important to also get to know these people off the podium. That's very important because you can't have someone who only wants to conduct and is unable to build these bridges, mm -hmm. whether it's to the musicians, the community, the board, it needs to be someone so who does all that. And we're very realistic. You're not going to find someone that checks all 50 of your boxes, yeah. but ideally someone who checks 41, mm -hmm. great. Good, exactly. So, um, and we're also not all going to agree yeah. in the end. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure not everyone agreed with Bloomstead's hiring, not everyone agreed on Michael's hiring, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And, but both of them worked out beautifully for the symphony. Yeah, that's right. What inspires you about musical institutions in San Francisco and how they're changing right now? Hmm. <laughs> We can always skip it, too. No, I'd, 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 I'm, I'm really thrilled with the work that the symphony is doing, outreaching into the community, and especially the work that they do for the schools. Mm. Um, they send musicians into the, to all of the public schools, and at a very early age, interest kids in saying, this is really special, this is really something that you could do, this is something exciting, and, and I think that's really important in keeping classical music alive. And so in some ways, it's, it is the most important thing we do, you know, because, because it's creating generations of music lovers. So yeah, yeah. that I find very um, hopeful and inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Peter and the Wolf, when it did, uh, like they did that when I was in, uh, it must have been in first grade. Mm -hmm. I still remember that wow. when I reached that school. Um, so, uh, can Mr. Bachman provide full text notes for each piece of music of the service beyond what is provided now? Not just hymns, but do all the singing, the psalms, the motets, the voluntary, etc. <laughs> Citing dates and... Well, I think that's more like not really a question, but... <laughs> right, right. Well, it actually, it actually is a question. Yeah. It, it begins with the word can. <laughs> can Mr. That's Bachman do this? Right. And I think maybe just to, to uh, offer a little bit of clarity by way yeah. of our staff people, um, we, that makes for a very big leaflet right, every right. Sunday. Right. Um, and I don't actually have oversight over that, but... but um, um, well, it's good. Yeah. To, it's nice to be loved. It's, it is. It's, it's <laughs> great. It's great that people want to know. And, uh, you know, there have been times in the past when I thought, oh, if I know something particularly interesting about a piece, I'll write a little program note and it will appear in the wrapper. Right. And we do things like that with the, um, with the uh, Requiem and, and the Christmas you, concerts um, and the, things yeah, like that. Yeah, the Christmas concerts. That's yeah. what I thought you did. So um, if that's a request to have more, more program notes about the music, then yeah. the answer is yes. Great, I can do great. that. Perfect. Um, analog versus digital. How has it changed you as a music maker? Plummy sound versus harsh sound. That's a good question. Well, I still listen to LPs at home. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Um, my my uh, a friend of mine gave me her LP player when she was getting rid of it, and I still think it's a better way to listen to certain types of music. Yeah. I think piano music sounds better. 
um, on an LP than it does on a CD. Um, I'm, I'm not very interested in technology, kind yeah. of ironically. So yeah. um, my well, friends off, often say, boy, you have the worst speakers of any mu anybody that's ever interested <laughs> in music. I, am, I just go, I don't care if I can hear it, I'm happy, I guess. So. But I think percussion instruments sound better on LP too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about mm. the thump yeah. or the, you know. Do you have anything to weigh in on that? Well, definitely when CDs came out, I felt that they were a little bit sterile, a little bit cold. Yeah. I missed the slight static hiss. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've listened to more of that and now we've moved on to, to the, the Spotify and things that are online, yeah. I've come to ex appreciate actually the clarity that mm -hmm. is there. Um, but uh, I'm definitely at heart um, not an audiophile, but I do, I learned uh, in the Juilliard and the Eastman libraries on turntables. Right, so I right, was skipping around yeah. and I was listening to these. So that sound is still um, in my mind. And if you were to hear what makes a great Italian instrument a great Italian instrument, it's actually not the smoothness of it generally. It's actually um, a certain amount of growl or dirt mm -hmm. in the sound. So um, we were once doing a recording session, uh, chamber music, and the recording engineer said, I'm, I'm just gonna move the mic a little further away. There's a little bit too much um, a roughness in the sound. And someone else said, you know, the symphony paid, because the symphony owns it, the symphony paid a lot for that growl, mm -hmm. <laughs> for that dirt in the sound. So, so it's actually, and I think LP's analog actually maybe gets that That's a little so bit better. Um, what do you listen to at home? I mean, are you, do you ever just get, I'm sick of this, I'm just not going to... You know. I generally don't listen to music. Too much? Yeah. 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 How about you too? I, I, um, I listen to classical and jazz both. Yeah. I like jazz a lot. As a bass player, we didn't get included into the string quartet repertoire oh. um, and for chamber music. And so um, I, I try to play as much chamber music as humanly possible, but the bass plays sort of uh, a in jazz, almost like a quartetish role in a certain way um, uh, uh, in there, and, and uh, so it's satisfying. I think most bass players actually listen to jazz quite yeah. a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine that. Yeah, because it's another instrument that is, has such a central role in, those, in that, that form of music. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thinking back on what you, um, on your own personal um, best and greatest performances. Describe the emotions and how you felt in the moment. What did it feel like when you're at your very finest, very best? I think generally it's best to think about those performances after the last note. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've, I've been in the middle of something and you've practiced this run and you get it and you start patting yourself on the back. Good job, Amos. Well you done. You nailed that, and then <laughs> you miss the easiest little thing yep. coming up. So I find it's just the best thing to stay in the moment and look back. If something goes well, say, I'm glad that went well, but ha staying in the moment is actually one of the biggest yeah. challenges as a performer. Mm -hmm. And that's why actually with my iPhone, and with my students' iPhones, I, I suggest that they record themselves often, make their practicing formal to practice the, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's very easy to make practicing informal, and that's why so many of us say, I was playing so well in my room mm -hmm. 10 right. minutes ago, right. and it's because actually there's, there's a sort of gap in, in our yeah, knowledge of how to, psychology you know, to prepare for things. But for me, I practice my hardest, and I hope that it's a you know, my best performance ever, but really, to date, I have maybe two or three of those performances where I played better than I am. Otherwise, generally, I'm, I'm pretty representative of who I am, which is a little disappointing to me, but I, you have to put in all this work, uh, but really, because what we do is more like an Olympic sport, you, you train for these five, 20 minutes of, right. and, and it's, it's gone like that. Yeah. So you really have to treat it in the, in the moment. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, preaching is a little bit like that too. It's hard not to evaluate yourself yeah. as you're doing it. Um, 
But I, I, as soon as it stops, I'm already, okay, that second section has to be shorter, and I stuttered in the introduction. And, right. you know, um, so I can imagine it's good, good not to be that third order reflection. It's not a place for doing that when you're actually right. performing. Right. Yeah. It's also interesting when you're a, as a conductor, you know, because I, I tend to be very oh, yeah. much very critical of my own self, right? right I think right. that everything I do is terrible. Yes. Just, that's just the way it goes. But the happiest moments are when you can look at the choir and you can tell that they know that they did a better job. Yeah than we have ever done with that piece. We've sung that piece hmm. 10 times, you know, in the last yeah. three years, and that time we absolutely nailed it, you know? Yeah. And, and you can look at their faces and see that, and that's what makes me feel the best. Right, you that know? Howell's Magnificat that moved me so deeply right. was moving you for a different reason. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Or I'm, I'm just appreciating it on a different kind, yeah, of, exactly. kind of level. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. Charles, do you have um, any thoughts about that? or? One of my, f about a, fa a favorite performance or, or the yeah, way that that, that felt feeling, during that exactly. time. Yeah. What is it like up there? Um, one of my favorite memories uh, of playing was actually had to do with the audience. We were playing on tour um, Mahler 6th in Vienna uh -huh. and it was such a special experience because the, uh, the people that came were so um, serious about what they were coming to hear. And before I remember warming up on stage and it would, the, there's just, it was just quiet out there, even during the tuning and the warm-up and everything. And, and so asking about the feeling, it just felt, it felt wonderful because their attention was so into what, what was going on with the music and, and, and being receptive. And, and so then I think the whole orchestra felt that way and it kept turning into this big circle, where, whereas then the orchestra would respond in a certain way, and then and then they would listen, and and there was really a, a wonderful sense of communication. I'm sure you must feel that while you're preaching. Yeah, oh, definitely, too. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's almost so much more of it. It's just like people are either giving you, they're giving you something all the time, but just like everybody here is right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's 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 almost always a dance. And if people aren't paying attention, you, you're just like, oh, I could just skip this whole section and just go <laughs> right at the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. And it's my fault, I mean, to, for not making it something that's worth paying attention to. Um, well, yeah. it's, a, it's a group, it's really it's a, group, a, it's a, group a group experience. experience. It really is. That's exactly yeah. right. Well, we're so fortunate. Um, ben has got to go because yes. he's got to get up and um, rehearse the choir. Um, but we we're very fortunate that, um, that uh, Charles and Amos are going to play music for us. Um, but I wanted to make a quick announcement before we did that and to let you know that next week Robert Sapolsky will be here. Um, he is a primatologist and a neuroscientist at Stanford University. He's a fascinating writer. I think um, he's going to be very interesting. He's going to also be the preacher for next Sunday. And we're going to have, he's, he's an atheist preacher <laughs> it's gonna be here for us um, but I'm really looking forward to it to it I hope you're able to come um, the service will be immediately after this at 11 o'clock um, we're a, a donation based um, a little entity so if you can make a gift on your way out um, that would be great and I want to thank um, Ben and Charles and Amos for for this great conversation thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you.